Yeah. Can you all hear me? Anyway, uh, it's great to be here. Um, as you can tell, I'm fairly new to Ireland. Uh, I'm quite blown away, honestly, by McGill and just how this is established. I don't think I can think of anything quite like it in the U.S. where I'm from. Uh, yeah, I'm delighted to be here. Thanks, thanks, Joe, for for bringing me along. Um, so. Over the last two years, really two or more years since, since I've come over, I, I've been running a small data science team um, for a Dublin-based startup. Uh, so we work with small and medium-sized companies to help them stay competitive uh, online. These, these are online businesses. Uh, we do that by partnering with them as a technological partner, a financial partner, um, and it's actually been quite, uh, I think, quite a success story so far. I'm, I'm, I'm quite happy with how it's going. I think bearing in mind that large enterprise companies uh, have massive budgets and technical resources to establish an online presence, really the aim is to level that imbalance. Um, digital has certainly lowered the barrier for entry, but growing and adapting an online business is an increasingly technical and data intensive uh, challenge. And, and yes, this involves advertising. Um, so in the first part of this talk, I, I want to kind of look, look at the state of, of digital advertising today, kind of as, as I see it, I, I, I work quite closely with it, um, and really provide, I think, concrete examples of how automation and targeting really work. Um, I think with the fallout of, from the Cambridge Analytica revelations and their ill-gotten targeting strategies uh, still unfolding, um, you probably have heard the news. Facebook was just fined yesterday $5 billion uh, for their role in the data leak. Um, we are in the midst of an unraveling of these technologies to comply with higher demands on transparency and data protection. And this has certainly uh, been brought on, I think, by GDPR and the like. And I, I, I welcome more of it in, in the U.S. And, and, the, and, the, and the wider world. Building explainability into our algorithms is a tough challenge. Uh, but I, I think it's the right one to focus on. In some cases, in fact, it's a legal requirement. So in the second part of this talk, I. I will illustrate how biases can get established in AI systems um, and emphasize the value of explainability and rooting them out. Bear with me, I'll explain what I mean by explainability, okay? <laughs> so digital advertising. So worldwide, ad spend on digital advertising is projected to exceed 300 billion euros this year. Um, and so what's interesting about that number is this will likely be the first year where digital advertising uh, is on par with you know, traditional advertising. In Europe, actually, digital advertising has been far ahead of traditional uh, advertising for quite a few years now. Um, you're all aware of Google, Facebook, Amazon, and perhaps Alibaba, but perhaps don't appreciate that these four alone receive 70% of those 3 billion euros, or th 300 billion euros. I can't think of a single instance of a company that I've worked with that isn't advertising on at least one of these platforms. So I guess to demonstrate the, the level of innovation and automation that has followed this money, uh, let me take you through the bidding war for your eyeballs that happens underneath your nose uh, as you click around in your web browser. So first, most websites with any available ad slots you know, uh, will interface with advertisers through uh, something called an ad exchange. As soon as the web page in your browser begins loading, uh, your user information is passed on uh, to participating advertisers. Advertisers will match these details 
to their specific target audiences and generate bids accordingly through some degree of automation and optimization. Bids from advertisers are collected in the ad exchange and entered into an auction and essentially, generally is the case, the ad slot goes to the highest bidder. This is, this is programmatic advertising that is quickly becoming the majority of the way ads are delivered um, uh, online. It takes a tenth of a second for the winning bid to be served to your browser. You probably aren't even aware of this is happening. This is happening before you can blink your eyes, literally. I mean, it is truly a feat of engineering. Okay. Uh, let me bring up a slide. So, show of hands, how many Facebook users do we have in the room that, let, let's say, visit Facebook once a week? Okay, so uh, I wonder if that number's dwindled over time. I, I, I've actually deleted my account. <laughs> um, but I recommend you. If you do use it, I recommend you check out why am I seeing this ad. So this is a, this is a feature that's actually, I think, quite quietly been rolled out um, over the course of this year. And actually, there's a new version at, even as of this month uh, with, with, that's uh, been refined with user feedback. Um, so you'll see an ad in your feed, and you can click into it and, and, and under, maybe get a little bit more information about why is this here. I, I think this is this is quite quite instructive. So have a look here. Basically, you're getting two pieces of information, right? Um, basically, how how am I getting targeted, and sort of what what data is is am I being targeted with? So you know, in the first section, right? The reason is is because Jasper Markets here had your email and a list of customers, and they sent that to Facebook and they've targeted you accordingly. Um, and the data they're using is the fact that you're over 18, so they have your age and your location, right? It's quite useful. I think I, I welcome you to go through your feeds and actually look at this. This, this is quite uh, unprecedented transparency from Facebook, I must say. And it really gives you insight into how their targeting works. So I, 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 suggest, I suggest you give it a try. Um, so, I should I should add here that um, you might go a step further. Uh, there's functionality here to manage your preferences and and actually start opting out. So, if you're targeted using your email, say from a company or even a third party, you can you can uh, opt out of that completely. It, it's it's, I would say it's a step in the right direction. But it doesn't yet achieve the bar of explainability I think that I think is required. I'll give you an example. Um, this is from the United States, I'm sorry. Uh, the Department of Housing and Urban Development in the US recently uh, brought a lawsuit against Facebook uh, in violation of fair, a Fair Housing Act. Um, basically, Facebook was providing targeting uh, criteria to advertisers, which allowed them to uh, place ads or discriminate ads based on race and gender, and this violates that act. In order to settle, Facebook has agreed to sort of remove these targeting options uh, from advertisers. That doesn't necessarily address discrimina discriminatory targeting. Recall the pro programmatic bidding process I described earlier and optimizations that occur underneath, which ultimately determine who sees what ad. Right? If that optimization preferences, say, postal codes in affluent suburbs, uh, it's almost surely going to discriminate based on race. I'd be surprised if Facebook are fully aware of how their algorithms are biased in this way. It'll be interesting for me, and I think this is something to really to continue to keep an eye on. It'll be interesting to see how far lawmakers are, are willing to, to regulate in this area uh, where there is really a dearth of explainability. So I kind of following on I, some of the stuff Martin brought up, it's, it's, it's really not too hard to see um, 
how bias worms its way into uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, in, it, in the types of AI I'm discussing here, they, they really co it really comes into existence uh, by training algorithms to optimize for certain outcomes, uh, typically with substantial amounts of historical data. The historical data we choose and the outcomes we preference, each, you know, in turn can bias out, uh, bias these algorithms. So, I think I think to this point, right? It's not the algorithms; it's the it's it's the humans that build them and design them and and allow uh, and choose the data and make the choices that support them. Um, I, I want to show. Uh, I want to include a couple more examples just to uh, maybe make this a little bit more concrete. So there's a lot of text-based data lying all over the internet. Uh, and to leverage it, there's a, there's a whole host of algorithms that perform what's called natural language processing. This is how a, how a computer essentially processes text to, to make sense of it. Um, however, most algorithms can't actually directly uh, deal with text. They require numbers, numerical inputs. So, uh, one way to do that, there's a, a very well used approach called word to vec You don't need to worry about the name, but it's an attempt to pro basically provide a sort of faithful representation of language and numbers. Okay? This works by ingesting really large corpus of text documents. Um, so that's your historical data. And it does an optimization where it's trying to find numerical numbers whereby if I have two similar words, they should be numerically similar. That's, that's the optimization uh, that, it's, that it's going for. So this is a, this is a, this is a sort of illustration uh, to, I think, reveal a subtle bias that comes into these things. So, essentially what it's doing is it's taking words and, and putting, putting them in, in uh, putting a point there, right? So, I've chosen a few words. This is, an, this is an actual example. It's a bit of a toy illustration just to visualize. So, right, what you can see here is, you know, male and female are, you know, where they are in relation to one another. There's some similarity, but there's obvious differences. And then I put doctor. Can you guess what's can you guess what's behind the question marks? Nurse, nurse right? Male is the female, as doctor is the nurse. It's encoding this bias. You know, so look, this is this is a known problem and, and it's these biases are well understood, but you know, this is a precursor for later processing with other algorithms. So you can see how bias can get layered in and, and it's it's something to be quite careful of, depending on the application. So, I'll give, you, I'll give you another example, and just let me apologize as I move on to another US-centric example. Um, if you can't tell by my accent, my, my algorithms too have been biased. <laughs> um, so this is, this is Maryland's uh, third con congressional district. This, I don't know how much the word, the terminology gerrymandering has, has become known. Okay, okay, it's. I, I I don't know if it's. I don't know if it. Okay, good. I, I didn't. I didn't know if I had to explain it too thoroughly, but it's a huge problem in the U.S. Uh, congressional district lines are getting redrawn uh, at every congressional cycle. Right. Really, the goal here is to consolidate power. Uh, po political power and uh, establish, well, we have a two, essentially a two-party system, establish the dominant party for time <laughs> eternal, essentially. So this, this, is, this is a, a, a quite blatant example of this, where you're in the, the lighter white color is actually the congressional district, which conveniently wraps itself around all the the sort of center urban areas um, around Baltimore and Maryland, clearly cherry picking and uh, um, essentially disenfranchising huge voting uh, populations. 
So there's very much an algorithm going on here, right? You have data, you have demographics, and you have voting history data. And there's an outcome that's being optimized, right? Retain the seats that we currently that we currently hold. Um, I'm quite. Uh, I've been I've been following quite closely. I'm, I'm really encouraged by. It's essentially a movement of mathematicians and sociologists and political scientists in the U.S. that are really trying to combat this. It's been a persistent problem in the U.S. and I think in many democracies, uh, where it becomes very hard to find a legal basis for fighting it. Uh, so these these group of uh, scientists and mathematicians are essentially building a, an explainability algorithm where they can look at districts, they can it objectively prove bias, and they're working this through the court systems right now and Supreme Courts. It's actually gotten a little bit of attention in, in, the, um, in, in the Supreme Court in the US. We'll see where that goes, but there's a, there's a slow, uh, there's, there's, a, there's an iterative approach now where explainability on top of these congressional districts is starting to uh, find its way in actual legal decision making where, um, in fact, in some states, district lines have been completely redrawn on this basis. So I think that's uh, a real encouraging sign. Um, and I, invite, I, I welcome a lot more explainability in our algorithms. Uh, a lot of these examples are about essentially reverse engineering the existing, the, uh, the existing algorithm to expose the biases or even just blatant errors at their root. Um, I think the right path forward, and I, and I think it comes with regulatory pressure and consumer pressure uh, to build explainability into our algorithms as a first class citizen. This should, this, should be, this should be thought of at the beginning of the process. So um, I think when we start to do that, I think when we have clear guidelines, both regulatory and on the consumer side, I think uh, we can start to build trust. And I, yeah, I, really view these, I really view these algorithms and artificial intelligence as enabling technologies, therefore are good. Uh, th I think this is one one really promising way to get control over that over that process. So, I'll, I'll leave it there. And, and, and if there's more questions and discussion.